Well, welcome, old friends and new, to another episode of the Bring Your Own Grief Network. I am, as always, your humbled host, R. Glenn Kelly. Now, if, like me, you've experienced the tragic loss of a loved one, and afterwards, maybe when the waves that constantly crash down have eased up just a bit, you find yourself wondering about your emotional responses, your, your actions, and even your inactions to the loss, then you don't want to miss this episode, Grief and the Programmed Man. You know, I certainly consider myself the average Joe, <laughs> if there is such a thing. And all you average Joes out there have to forgive me for now, please, just for presuming that I am. I don't want to insult anybody, of course, but I'll be honest. If you would have asked me if I was average before the birth of my only child, my inflated, unhealthy ego would have just laughed at you. Average? Pfft. I was Superman, brother. Humbly, and I tell you all of this to bring you into the world of the huge unhealthy ego I once lived with. See, like many kids out of high school, I tried to run away and join the circus, but sadly, they wouldn't have me. They said I didn't have what it takes, so instead, the Marine Corps would have me. I joined the United States Marine Corps, Uncle Sam's misguided children, became an MP, a military policeman, and after four honorable years, came home to the suburbs of Washington, D.C. and got on the police department and stayed there until the tragic events of September 11, 2001, when I went to work for the U.S. State Department in D.C. Did I have an unhealthy ego? Jarhead? Cop? Federal agent? You're damn skippy, I did. Did I live off this ego for so long in my life? Yep, you're damn skippy, I did. It fed the alpha male wannabe inside of me. I was Superman in my mind, right? And I believed everyone else thought I was Superman too. See, an unhealthy ego is believing you are what you want others to believe you are. Bears repeating. An unhealthy ego is believing you are what you want others to believe you are. Truth be told, even today I fight it. I still have this inherent urge to show the world I am good. Go save the world. Be the hero. Thankfully, maybe I'm, I'm getting a little long in the tooth and my bright red cape is fading just a bit. I still want to, though, and, and probably could, too. It would just be a lot like the Toby Keith song where he sings, I ain't as good as I once was, but I'm as good once as I ever was. And trust me, I'll need a nap after that once. Now, I, I kid a lot, of course. My inflated ego, or my need to believe my self-esteem is based on what others think of me, is pretty much gone now. Pretty much. That actually started to get tamped down a bit with the birth of my son, Jonathan, who's my only child. When my beautiful baby boy, my only baby boy, was born, he was immediately diagnosed with a rare congenital heart defect known as hypoplastic left heart syndrome something not picked up in the womb before birth. And I would be forced to somewhat enter a world of humility and compassion. See, this rare heart defect meant my son began life with only the two right chambers of his heart as the left side failed to develop in the womb. And on the very first day he was born, the doctor said he wouldn't make it through the night, his first night of life. But he did. He did survive through the God-given talents of an incredible cardiothoracic surgeon and his experimental procedure. But that meant Jonathan would be subjected to three excruciating open-heart surgeries, the last of which was done just before he turned two. So much to go through. Beginning at birth and all through his short life, Jonathan and I would be introduced to a world of other children and parents who faced dangers far and above anything I ever saw in my military or law enforcement career. And I felt emotions I had never felt before for myself and for my child and for others, discovered for the first time in my own life what it is to love and be loved unconditionally and to be compassionate to people I didn't really know before. One would believe this alone would bring a man to develop the true meaning of life. Change a man's core values, right? Now, 
Little John John would have occasional medical tweaks along the way, but following those initial open heart surgeries, his prognosis was for a full life, and he prospered. He had limitations, of course, like no contact sports, but he took that well, well enough to become an incredible golfer in his early teens and through his first year of high school before he passed. But anyway, life would go on during that time, and my super ego would return. Heck, I even took pride in being the father of a son who should have died at birth. Get that. And John was a legend of sorts, at least in the pediatric medical field. Doctors swooned over how he recovered and how well he was doing while growing up and going through these tweaks. And part of that, in my unhealthy super ego, in my mind, had to be because of how I cared for him after his surgeries, right? His health was in part due to my loving care and attention. I get credit too, right? Well, I took credit anyway. Super dad to a super kid. But when complications from a relatively routine tweak took his heart, took his life, at the tender age of 16, I lost that amazing child and I burned inside. Pain I had never felt before. You know what I'm talking about. But in true fashion, I kept my feelings inside where no one else could see them. To be the rock in front of others. To be the rock for others. Take the lead, arrange his funeral services, and dutifully play host to a multitude of family and friends who travel cross country to be there. It was my way to not expose my painful emotions to others. Emotions they might perceive as me being weak. And when all the muss and fuss was over and everyone returned to their own lives, I had returned to just me and to work. There at work, I convinced myself that my employees depended on my strength and my leadership and without conscious thought, decided that if holding my pain and anguish inside had worked so well in front of family and friends, it would do the same at work. I'll be a man, suck it up and be just fine. These were subconscious thoughts. I'd convinced myself without even knowing it. Sadly, however, over time, I also found the ability to shut off the grief altogether, along with the poor logic that if doing so allowed me to function well in front of others, be the man I thought they thought I was, it would work when I was alone too. Shut it down. Shut down the emotions. Shut down the pain. And I could function 24-7 then, right? And this decision, refusal actually, to grieve my son would go on for six months after his loss. Six months of remaining busy at work and at home. Spending hour upon hour in the wood shop, building furniture, fixing things, or just even in the house, fixing this or that, anything that needed something to do. Heck, I even generated my own honeydew list just so I had things to occupy my mind. You know what I'm talking about. Well, I said it went on for six months, right? It was at the six month mark mm -hmm, when the spirit of my sweet child came to me in the shower one arbitrary morning as I got ready for work. Hence the title of my first award winning grief support book, Sometimes I Cry in the Shower. Regardless, John didn't talk in spoken words. I just felt him all around me. Instead, the words I heard, I felt as plain as if he were right in my ear speaking them. He said to me, Dad, how dare you? How dare you not grieve me? How dare you not live out the legacy I left behind for you? Then he was gone, as quick as he came. Again, no spoken words when he was there. But somehow I understood a revelation through him that I was damaging myself physically and emotionally by not honoring the life he led while here on earth. And he showed me how each of us have our own individual plan with our maker. And even better, I suddenly understood how blessed I had actually been to be a part of his life. An incredible honor in realizing that God and Jonathan actually allowed me to be a part in my son's short time on earth. And that didn't end simply because he resides somewhere else now. I also received an understanding that there 
is a plan for me as well. And since I am still here, my plan isn't complete. Not yet, anyway. So, I began to grieve my son's loss that day. And while I knew I could never completely comprehend what my own plan was, it was restarted that day with an urge to understand why I did what I did. Why Jonathan had to say, how dare you? My initial thoughts were simply that if I understood, I might carry a lighter load on my journey towards wholeness and healing. And I would immediately become somewhat OCD in researching both male and female emotions and why we respond in differing ways, especially as it relates to grief. Now, of course, I paint with a broad brush as we are all, both men and women, as unique as snowflakes and fingerprints, no two exactly alike. But I discovered that the prevailing path for any child, male or female, begins in part long before birth. Actually, long before even being conceived. See, our, our very DNA is encoded within centuries of traits that began encoding themselves into our very genes as soon as Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden, or when we first crawled from the primordial ooze if you're not a believer in God. To be brief, for males, the need to hunt, to develop tools, weapons, build homes, protect and provide for family, and establishing oneself within the hierarchy of others required showing strength and hiding weaknesses, much like my instincts after loss. You can't show weakness before others. Now, I'm sure you've heard the term nature versus nurture along your travels. It's actually one of the longest running debates in the psychological fields. Do we get our behaviorisms from nature or do we get them from nurture? It's been an ongoing argument dating back to the mid 1800s. However, it was fairly recent when both camps threw in the white flag finally and admitted that both nature and nurture influence who we are, what our mannerisms could be like. Now, that's nature and nurture, no longer nature versus nurture. Yet today, both camps still debate which one holds more power over the other. I guess no one wants to be a loser, right? It's a bad trait. Regardless, what's lying within our DNA, our genes, is the nature part of it. And within this nature influence, you might find it interesting to consider the words survival and negative bias, at least as it relates to this. See, negative bias. From the days of loincloths and dwelling in caves through thousands of years of development or evolution, the human race has focused on one thing and really one thing only, survival of the species. And survival oftentimes relied upon remembering what you had experienced in the past that might kill you today. Even today, we tend to remember the bad things that have happened to us in greater detail than the good ones. It's survival. And in order for it to help the species survive, it was encoded within our DNA for the next generation. Makes sense? One example I like to talk about are snakes. Yeah, there are, there are some of you out there that are avid snake lovers, and I apologize. I'm not knocking you for that. But for most of us um, normal people, we have a natural repulsion to snakes, me included. Heck, even when I stumble across snakes today that I know to be harmless, I have a natural reaction to, frankly, kill them or actually jump away in disgust. I'm not a big guy for the snake display at the zoo either. And speaking of that, would it surprise you to know that in psychological testing, the vast majority of young children who had never had contact with snakes or even discussed these creatures with their parents reacted in fear and repulsion when shown pictures of a snake, just a picture recorded in their brain waves and observed through their mannerisms at the time of the testing. Yet they didn't have such a repulsion to large lizards or other reptiles. Who knows? Maybe, uh, maybe it's an Adam and Eve thing, right? Anyway, back to it. Nature and nurture. Nurture now is what we're exposed to from the crib and beyond after we're born. And long story short, most men were raised or nurtured with such phrases as big boys don't cry. Don't be a sissy and more, right? From just beyond infancy, we begin programming to hide our weaknesses, programmed by our older male role models in life. 
father, big brother, maybe athletic coaches. You get the idea, right? And not by any real fault of their own. After all, our male role models had the same nurturing from their male role models, right? All this means that some of the way we respond is pre-wired into our subconscious by both DNA and our upbringing. And the subconscious is that part of our mind that acts on our behalf without our conscious effort or control automatically when it recognizes the need, just like heartbeats and lung inflations, right? Does that make sense? It's who we are inside. So look, for me, I had a rather tough time after I lost Jonathan, and I'm sure, sadly, so did many of you after your loss. But when I look back now, I'm disappointed with my early grief response, how I repress my feelings. I was not disappointed, however, that I held my emotions from others. No, I, I learned that that's who I am, and I own that. I am not one to show outward emotions of grief. That's all. And, and I was okay with that. I, I'm still okay with that. I'm the average man. It's in my genes and it's in the way I was raised. Now, what I was disappointed in was that I had initially convinced myself that if keeping my emotions from others allowed me to function, then hiding it from myself would work too. That's simple. And we discussed some of the horrific impacts of repressed grief in another episode here on the BYOG Network. But for now, our focus is really dealing with the programming and, and with you knowing that no one, especially me, is trying to change who you are. You are you, unique in many ways, but also subject to influences you have little immediate control over. Nature and nurture. So, we come down to the real money question I had for myself in my journey towards healing. And real quick, we'll never truly heal from our loss, will we? I hope we all know that. But we can and will together live a life of peace and purpose again. All the while, bringing our lost loved one with us. Remember that, please. We don't leave them behind just because we're moving forward. But again, the question I had to ask myself was, can I, as a man, change my instinctual need to repress my emotions and hide them from myself? Others might also want to change that urge to hide them from others, feel this to be unhealthy in their journey, and that's fantastic. But can we actually overcome nature and nurture? The answer, I believe, is absolutely yes, we can, regardless of how deep they lie within us. Those traits, especially the ones that live in our DNA, waiting to be triggered, developed over centuries to help ensure our very survival, right? But the key word is they developed, which tells me that at one time they weren't there at all. And the same goes for those that come from nurturing, upbringing. We didn't start out this life with them. Let me bring up something, uh, something I hope that I can tie into really well for you. Marine Corps boot camp, okay? I survived Marine Corps boot camp Paris Island. Even today, arguably the toughest physical and mental reprogramming on the planet. Without question, Marine Corps boot camp is designed exclusively to reprogram new Marines. Turn each young recruit into someone who is automatically obedient to all orders. The term used in the Corps is unquestionable response to orders, and it's highly understandable. See, in combat, orders are given by competent leadership, hopefully, and a failure to follow these orders or even pause to question orders could result in your fellow Marines dying. Those Marine Corps traits were programmed into me, deep into my subconscious, and I could respond without conscious effort. It happens for me. It happens for other Marines. It happens for everybody in the U.S. military. And like the DNA encoded traits inside of us, these new program traits became a vital necessity for all of us to survive. Well, to survive for me during the four years that I served. However, when I received my honorable discharge and no longer needed those traits, I was able to leave them behind, albeit with some level of resistance and effort. 
They were just no longer needed and in many ways no longer proved a positive in my life after the service to my country came to an end, even though I had moved on to law enforcement. <laughs> Can you imagine calling the police to make a report of theft or, or something like that and watch me get out of my cruiser and low crawl up to your front door? Not a real positive, is it? Transversely, there are many traits I kept because they were positive. Survival traits as a cop were big ones, of course, but the little ones that I enjoyed and took from the core to this day, get this, I can't use an umbrella. Marines did not use umbrellas. It was forbidden. Now, even today, I walk closer to the street when walking on the sidewalk with a woman. I can't wear a plain t-shirt in public, white or green, and can't just stick my hands in my pockets and leave them there. All these things a Marine was taught and things that I found once I was out that had value in my life. Now, let's go back. It is then my position that men can overcome negative traits brought to us by both nature and nurture, traits you feel are negative. However, that said, it ain't going to be easy, brother. And we can only start by identifying those traits, mannerisms, behaviors, which we ourselves deem as adverse, unneeded, or even harmful, to our lives today. Once identified, only a dedicated and focused effort can be made to work towards your desired change. Now I say work towards since a process is obviously not a light switch to be turned on and off. Again, it starts first only with recognition and then habitually pushing oneself beyond the normal comfort zones. I think most of us have heard this before. Change within ourselves can only come when we push ourselves outside of our comfort zones. Sound advice, I promise. As for me, I'm still working towards devolving many things I feel are negatives in myself. I don't think we can ever be done. I've made headway though on, on grief and, <laughs> and my ability to let others know that I hurt inside with an immeasurable anguish that comes with the loss of a child. However, I'm not going to look back and beat myself up over not being where I want to be this day. I've identified who I want to be and who I do not want to be and will patiently work on it over time. I highly doubt I'll ever be perfect and I'll ever be that enlightened soul when I leave this earth, but I will continue to walk in that direction. It's like the journey of healing. I'll, I'll never completely heal from losing my child, but there are parts that I don't want to heal. I don't want to lose the feeling of missing him, of longing for him to be with me here on earth. You know, a, a very well-respected spirit, spiritualist once said that we each have two people always dwelling inside of us. One we like and the other we don't. And they will always be there, always be a part of who we are. But we should never allow the two to argue with each other as it solves nothing and exhausts them both. And besides, arguing with yourself in public could actually get you in, in most states anyway, at least 48 hours of involuntary observation in the nearest mental health facility. And I got to agree with that. So that's it for this episode of Grief in the Programmed Man. And listen, guys, I know grief is not a lighthearted issue, so I hope I haven't offended anyone with my attempts at humor today. Of course, I am so very sorry for your losses. I know you are of mine, but laughter can be good. I remember the first time I laughed after I lost my son, Jonathan. I remember it clearly, just as I remember the guilt I felt as soon as I realized I was laughing. But over time, it became okay, and it became healing. Laughter is a good medicine. And know that I have many other episodes here on the BYOG Network that cover the distinct differences in the way men and women express our emotions, especially as it relates to loss. Please watch them when you have the opportunity. We cover nature and nurture more and, and the ways that we're pre-wired to respond in just the way we often do. And more than anything else, it lets us know that we are all different, but we are all okay. 
Now, do me a favor, please, and leave us some comments below this video and like it and share it with others who are going down the same path of hope and healing as you and I. And hey, why not subscribe to the BYOG channel? It costs nothing. Your email is not trapped in some marketing plan, and it helps other bereaved souls find us for support. Thank you. So that's it for this BYOG episode, where you bring your own emotions, bring your own pains, bring your own questions, and bring your own grief. As always, I am R. Glenn Kelly, father to my angel child, Jonathan Taylor Kelly, and we both wish you peace and purpose. <music>